the webinar is also um, being held in conjunction with the release today of a CNS uh, occasional paper titled Scientific Risk Assessment of Genetic Weapon Systems, which provides a, a deep dive uh, into, these, uh, into this topic Again, looking at the um, emerging field of precision medicine, uh, understanding the dual use implications, looking in particular at state actor motivations in this space, and, um, and then examining how, what, th what this um, translates to in terms of, of policy guidance and recommendations to manage both the benefits of this emerging field uh, and the technologies within while still uh, minimizing the risk that it might be applied to development of genetic weapon systems. Um, toward this end, uh, I just um, I will share here a um, a, uh, a a screenshot of the um, of the paper. Uh, this is from our website, and again, it was just uh, posted today. It's also on the carousel on the homepage of our um, Center for Nonproliferation Stud Studies website, nonproliferation.org. Uh, we're posting a link uh, also to this report in the chat here today. But this report is, uh, is available for, for download. Uh, it features contributors, including our, our featured speaker today, Dr. Rich Pilch, Jill Luster, Miles Pomper, and myself, Robert Shaw. I direct the Export Control uh, Nonproliferation Program for CNS. And I will be serving as the uh, moderator here uh, for, uh, for today's event. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I, I uh, want to properly introduce um, uh, our featured speaker, Dr. Rich Pilch, who uh, is a colleague and a, and a close friend of ours, um, but uh, we, we certainly um, will provide here uh, um, the, uh, uh, an introduction that reflects just the rich background, the extensive background that uh, Dr. Pilch is bringing uh, to this field in a study of an emerging area like um, precision medicine. Uh, Dr. Pilch is, uh, is a non-resident fellow with the Center for Nonproliferation Studies and is currently program manager of the Defense um, uh, Threat Reduction Agency's Cooperative Threat Reduction Advisory and Assistance Services contract at Noblesse a nonprofit science and technology firm in the Washington DC area. Uh, we will take care to note here though, that Dr. Pilch's remarks will be delivered in his personal capacity. And prior to his current work uh, uh, with Nobles, um, uh, Dr. Pilch and many of you uh, 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 recall was uh, uh, served most recently as director of our CNS uh, chemical and Biological Weapons Nonproliferation uh, Program. Uh, and uh, he is um, also a, a physician by, by training. He received his MD from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and Masters of Public Health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of, of Public Health. Uh, and from the, um, really since the 2002 timeframe, shortly after the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax incident uh, that, that, that followed shortly after, uh, Dr. Pilch um, uh, sort of delved into the security dimension of the, of the uh, biomedicine field and with a focus on, on biological weapons nonproliferation. That year, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship in chemical and biological weapons nonproliferation at our center. Uh, after which he spent nearly a decade overseas assessing and addressing biological warfare, bioterrorism, and public health emergencies of international concern, including threats uh, posed by um, the legacy programs in the former Soviet Union. Related to this, he has conducted assessments of um, uh, several civilian um, um, uh, biological uh, facilities in Russia, uh, delivering thousands of hours of man, of, of man hours training to former Soviet scientists spanning nonproliferation, bioethics and global health and security, um, and uh, coordinated uh, cooperative research projects and pandemic response exercises throughout uh, the Eurasia region. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, Dr. Pilch has also served on a number of technical panels and advisory boards uh, uh, supportive of the U.S. government's work in this area, uh, has authored a number of technical publications and white papers, including co-editing the Definitive Encyclopedia of Bioterrorism Defense with his longtime mentor, uh, Dr. Raymond Zelenskis. So, um, so with that introduction, we're very pleased to have uh, um, Dr. Pilch with us today. Uh, again, he was a lead contributor on our occasion, on the CNS occasional paper released today on the topic. And um, so, um, uh, so Rich, the uh, I'll I'll hand the floor to you. All right, thanks, Robert. Well, first of all, it's really nice to see you, Robert. It's really nice to see see Bill, see Caitlin, see Sarah, Emma. The other names I can see on my screen. Um, Certainly miss you guys. <laughs> it, it's it's interesting for those of you who don't know. I I, um, I sort of got tapped really suddenly in, in May um, when we were just in our last month of this project to uh, to support uh, the Defense Threat Reductions Cooperative Threat Reduction uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Uh, so it was a quick shift, and um, it's really nice I think to go back sort of through this few months later operational lens and look at the research we were doing and and maybe present it in a little bit of a different way. Um, the occasional paper that Robert showed, it's uh, structured, you know, like an academic brief. Uh, and uh, there are um, technical details that I think uh, will take you to any level you want to go, whether you just want to read it superficially or, or really go into the science. But I'll try to uh, speak to this from uh, you know, a threat reduction perspective. Uh, what is the threat and what do we need to do? Um, that's just where my head is at now. And if, if I did anything different, I think we should stop already because the introduction will far surpass anything that I can present. So let me go ahead and uh, try to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you guys have all that full screen. Uh, so just to reiterate, the this was a team effort. Uh, Robert uh, and Miles and Jill were indispensable to the effort. Um, we had uh, great support throughout the Institute and in particular our expert panel that helped us with the technical understanding who I'll brief later. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk us through my, my life and how that ties to the, uh, the technical developments in this field, going through a few waypoints and, and sort of defining I think today's release in my own mind at least is sort of a a fourth waypoint in where we are on this issue. Uh, so some of you may know that uh, the Center for Nonproliferation Studies as part of its role uh, provides country profile support to uh, the NTI website. Uh, and when I first came to the Center for Nonproliferation Studies to do my postdoc uh, in 2002, um, the person who was working on the South Africa country profile happened to be Dr. Jeff Bale. And if any of you know Dr. Jeff Bale, he is a tremendous researcher. Uh, so Dr. Jeff Bale did not just look at what was out there in, in the press. He went and read all the transcripts of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission documents um, and really keyed in on a couple of things. And one was this claim uh, that I've just recited here from a, a scientific article, but it's it's uh, you know citing the same Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, transcripts that one of the doctors who was part of the uh, Project Coast Biological Warfare Program that South Africa uh, ran through the 1980s talked about how they would like to uh, develop an ethnic weapon. Okay, so it was 2002. I was about a year removed from medicine, uh, and this was one of the first technical questions I ever had to face. Um, is that something that's real? Uh, and the only thing I could really do at the time was apply my medical knowledge, or, or lack thereof, if, you're, if you know me from my medicine and know that I was basically a C student, uh, but my medical knowledge to the problem, right? And so what we know about uh, ethnic and racial and regional variation in drug responses suggests that yes, there is a genetic basis for different reactions to different toxic, toxic chemicals, just like there is to anything else. So an easy example would be 
the phenomenon of, of Asian flushing, if you're familiar with that. So about 40% of Asians, and that's broadly characterized as everything from South Korean all the way over, uh, you know, um, so basically the whole Asian region, uh, if they have alcohol, they will flush. And the reason is because one of their enzymes that breaks down the ethanol um, has a genetic difference uh, that makes the one of the breakdown products, acetaldehyde, build up in their body. Um, so I was thinking to myself at the time, uh, okay, well, so we do know that there are genetic uh, underpinnings to the absorption, distribution, and metabolism and excretion pathway that could conceivably be manipulated um, to affect how a toxic substance um, impacts one person versus impacts a different person and possibly impacts one group, like in this case of, of the Asian flushing versus a different group. But what would it take to turn that into a weapon? Um, well, first of all, you would have to know the genome, right? And at the time in 2002, we still didn't know that yet. We were still finishing up the human genome project. Uh, then your next question would be, okay, there's the, the human genome is huge, right? And it's all these letters, right? So which letters mean what? Uh, and specifically mapping functions and regulatory sequences to the genome. So in this case, a function would be the enzyme that breaks down the alcohol. Uh, but it might not be that enzyme and the, the DNA that codes for that that would be targeted. It might be another part of the DNA that is actually regulating that. So that's the difference between a function and a regulatory element, but manipulating either one might have some sort of impact. Okay, so we need to know what the DNA map is, and then we need to know what the pieces on the map are that matter, okay? Then we need an ability to, uh, to distinguish unique subsets of the population based on sequences that matter, right? So, uh, it doesn't matter, for example, we'll change the, the example here. It doesn't matter if I can identify everyone with red hair and switch their red hair to black hair or with blue eyes and switch them to brown eyes. That's not what we would consider a target worthy change, right? Um, so we're looking for a functional sequence that could be adjusted to make uh, you know, a detrimental impact in the case of a weapon. So if you can do all that, find something that's on a map with a function and it's unique to the target population without being everywhere else, uh, then you actually have what we would call a targetable sequence. But then you still have to target it, which means you still have to get a weapon into the cell. And to do that, you have to get a weapon into the body. And potentially to do that, you have to get the weapon to the body from a distance. Uh, so there were so many steps involved uh, that back in 2002, it just didn't, we just weren't there. You could see a pathway to it, but but you you it just seemed distant future. That was 20 years ago, right? So, um, what could change the pathway? Disruptive technology, and I think that's part of where the discussion is going to go today. So, what happened since then? Um, so, th for people in our field who who pay attention, uh, you know, you sort of track these statements that pop up over the years. And interestingly, a number came from uh, China and some, uh, some Chinese military uh, personnel. Uh, this, these are a couple from one in particular, um, but there, there are, there's sort of a trend really from the late 90s and all the way up through 2017, I think is the latest one we cited in our paper, where um, Chinese military officials not speaking on behalf of the government, but speaking both in native language and English language um, uh, sources are talking about genetic weapons. And they're talking about them like they are interesting because they could actually be better uh, than conventional weapons. Uh, so here are just a couple of examples of those. Um, but uh, for people that were sort of tracking this idea of a genetic weapon, the, the, now we're midway through our first waypoint of the um, of the Project Coast Truth and Reconciliation Commission findings, and we're seeing some sort of continued interest, but not necessarily um, the tech development to go along with it. The tech development is coming out of 
the Human Genome Project and phase two of that, which is once you identify the genome, identifying what the functions and regulatory sequences are. Um, and, but what we're really looking at at this point in the 2000s is uh, what people are saying. So perception of the threat or indicators of potential intent. So then we get to the, what I would say the second big waypoint. And that was when, um, I see Milton is smiling. I feel like he's amused here. Uh, the second big waypoint, which is when President Putin or at the time Prime Minister Putin um, said that we need, um, I'll just, the quote is here and I, I left it sort of bigger so that you guys can see the full content. But basically what he says is the future technologies are going to apply to war and he listed genetic, quote unquote, genetic um, uh, principles to be developed as weapons. And in our community that gained a lot of steam, right? And we spent a lot of time trying to understand what that meant. Um, you know, it seems, seems pretty clear. He's not talking about for defensive purposes. Uh, it seems like he's envisioning a future battlefield involving these weapons. Uh, so. My predecessor and Milton, uh, you know, Ray Zlinskis who, and Milton, who were pioneering work in this space, uh, you know, did a lot of research. Uh, one of Ray's follow-ons to Ray and Milton's books, um, the follow-on book, I think, was called Biosecurity in Putin's Russia, actually went into uh, a lot of the expenditures that, um, that the Putin administration was making post-statement. Um, and those were, I, I guess, uh, you know, really brought to light in the public forum, uh, I think by Joby Work in 2018 in a Washington Post art article, where um, some reference to, to things that Ray and Putin, at, Ray and Milton have dug up, but uh, also a lot of additional information that showed, yes, that at the time of the statement, whether connected or not, uh, the Putin administration or the subsequent Putin administration was investing heavily back into the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, biological facilities that uh, prior to um, the dissolution of the Soviet Union housed part of the offensive Soviet biological warfare program. So typically when we think about Russian capability, we think about it in two contexts. We think about military versus civilian. Um, and the milita military facilities stemming all the way back to the former Soviet Uni Union have always been closed. So even someone like myself that was living in the country under the cooperative threat reduction umbrella where we were engaging U.S. to Soviets, or U.S. to Russians bilaterally uh, to decommission or redirect these facilities. I never had access to the military facilities. I don't know what was in there. Whereas I can speak somewhat confidently about what was going on in the early 2000s at, at any of the civilian facilities. Uh, if you look today and try to understand what's in the military facilities, it's an equal black box. It's really hard to find out. It's not like they're publishing their research in an open forum. Uh, their websites may have some information, but it's limited. Uh, you know, you really need to look at uh, the, the years and years of research that Ray and Milton put in and then try to ex extrapolate some of those findings and then look for, trace the sources and try to find other trajectories where you can take the information. Um, so one area you can take the information is to start looking at research relationships to people who do publish. Uh, and one group that publishes a lot in the Soviet Union is the Gamalaya Institute. They're sort of, you know, world world renowned really, they're the ones that have the Sputnik vaccine um, for COVID, for example. Uh, they developed an Ebola vaccine during the 2014-15 crisis. Um, they do a lot of CRISPR-Cas9 research, uh, which I haven't talked about yet, but I will when we move forward. Um, and, uh, and they have uh, documented research ties that you can track in the open source with some of these closed MOD facilities. So it doesn't tell you anything. Neither of these bullets tells you anything that tells you there's a threat. But what it does tell you is what, where there used to be an offensive program, there's investment. So you can assume at least dual use capability. Uh, and then there are research ties in this developing biotechnical space that is basically keeping pace with the field, right? So uh, if what that tells me is if the investment into the MOD facilities is on the nefarious side of the dual use spectrum, uh, then the technology, since it is keeping up with modern day technology and CRISPR-Cas9, it's a reasonable assumption to say that they're applying those technologies uh, to what they're doing from an offensive standpoint. All just, that's, that's you know, that's, that's what, uh, what we're, I guess, paid to do, right? Look at the data and make our assessment. That's my assessment. Um, on the civilian side, it's a lot more clear because uh, 
Gamma Lay Institute publishes widely, uh, and a lot there's a lot more information available. Um, so everything from what the institutes are publishing to what the the legal statutes are that are being released in the country. And as part of this effort, you know, we had a um, a uh, Chinese and Russian linguist doing all the native language research and pulling these these articles and helping us frame the understanding. Um, so on the civilian side, Russia has started investing um, pretty significantly in understanding. Um, the different uh, genetic variables going on first in their own people uh, and more recently in travelers to their country. Uh, those are typically for biometric and surveillance purposes, uh, you know, forensic applications. Um, but as we'll talk about in a little bit, data is data is data. And a lot of the race right now is for data. Uh, so these are just important things to track the technology and the data as sort of the two drivers that lead you to dual use transition to a, a potential capability. And then maybe in the last slide, I'll flip this all around, but I'm trying to build up a story and then have the curveball at the end. Um, okay, so that's first waypoint, Project Coast for me, uh, second waypoint, Putin, third waypoint, uh, Ed Yu. And I'm sure all of you guys who are in this field know who Ed is. Um, for me, it was a personal waypoint. Uh, for other people, they probably were tracking the articles. I happened to be in a meeting in 2018 with Ed Yu and he gave a brief on uh, the US bioeconomy in China. Um, and Ed is a, a FBI field officer. Um, I don't think it's his job to worry about, uh, you know, biotechnology in China and the bioeconomy. I think it's just something that caught his eye, just like, um, you know, DIY bio communities caught his eye. This was the other big thing I think that, that uh, he noticed and, and could see was a problem. And what he identified as a potential problem was that the US as a capitalist country, uh, always looking to cut costs and increase profit margins and increase uh, you know, um, stock prices and everything else that we, you know, I don't mean to be cynical about it, but that's the reality, had started outsourcing a lot of their DNA, DNA testing to China. Um, and it, it came in sort of two ways. One is outsourcing and one is Chinese, the Chinese uh, parent companies buying US companies. Um, and what that essentially meant was that China was getting a lot of Americans DNA. Um, and the questions at the time were, well, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that they can develop a weapon against us? Well, that wasn't what we were talking about back then. We were just talking about this, uh, these genetic data will enable someone somewhere at some point to develop a targeted therapy that will be very expensive. And if that targeted therapy or a whole percentage of targeted therapies are owned by China and not the US, then there's a tremendous uh, shift in the playing field of, of the space, right? Uh, because we are essentially beholden to them for the therapeutics that we as American citizens require. Um, now, to be clear, there's tremendous advantage in everyone moving this field forward. Things are dual use because the good side is good, right? And one of the things I don't want to forget to talk about because this is interesting to me um, is that, that that should be the underlying message. We have to keep the good stuff going forward and pushing the field forward for good. Um, but in this particular case, what Ed was noticing is while we're pushing the field forward, if we're sharing all of our data, we're essentially giving anyone access to those data to either develop tailored pharmaceuticals that then we as Americans can't develop or potentially to have extortable information. So for example, if someone were to look at my DNA and be able to pick up that I've got markers for alcoholism or markers for early cancer, things like that. And you, know, you can just sort of imagine all the things someone's DNA could tell, tell you. Um, and the other thing Ed was, in, was very keen to note was it's a one-way street. We were sharing all of our DNA information, but China wasn't sharing their own. China was very careful not to share its own, and not with the US, with the world. They had their own restrictions on their people's DNA, and it remains that way today. Uh, so US sort of just lets it all be out there. We put it all online, we put it in our databases, and, and um, we outsource it, and we don't consider it sort of a strategic commodity the same way we would consider a credit card number or a social security number. And that was what Ed was really getting at. Um, so you could sort of 
walk out of Ed's presentation and do a little research on your own and say, you know, well, where are we compared to China on this problem? And you can say, okay, in the Obama administration, we invested a few hundred million in precision, precision medicine. China invested 9.2 billion, right? Um, and you can start figuring out, okay, well, where are they in the US with US genomic data? And you can just in the open source pull all of these different relationships where, um, you know, BGI, for example, which is the biggest uh, Chinese firm doing this work, has contracts with Johns Hopkins and with all the other big hospitals and big companies that, that we all just come to and know and recognize as US uh, sort of authorities in this space. Um, so there's, you know, extensive data on this in the report that we won't go into, but I, you know, the bottom line is that from a precision medicine, medicine perspective, and then also from a potential um, illicit application perspective, totally irrespective of whether a genetic weapon is in the realm of possibility, this is a problem, right? So this is something that no matter what else I say today, when we get to talking about export controls, we almost want to talk about export controls of, of genetic data more for this problem than we even want to talk about it for any sort of genetic weapon application. So that brings us to 2020. Um, after that EDU brief, um, Bill and um, a few of others and of I talked to a potential funder. Um, we shared our ideas about really trying to understand this problem better. Um, and we received a grant to do it. And that, that's the grant that this report is founded on. Um, just as we were starting, the National Academy of Sciences released a report that frankly, I, I should have known, but didn't know was, was under development. Um, and these were the findings of the National Academy of Sciences report. So a couple notes about National Academy of Sciences. I know you guys know this, but you know, highest scientific body in, in America. And this was ODNI funded. So intelligence funded, High in sci highest scientific body in America. And I included the details for you guys to have, but uh, you know what it really says is it would be really hard to develop a weapon, but the technology is moving quickly, so we have to keep watching it. And that's very, very you know, useful conclusion, but I, you know, we wanted more, right? So when we went into our research project, um, what we were really trying to understand is you know, what is the epidemiology here? You know, what is the who, what, when, where, why, how of this, of this challenge? Is this something we should even be worried about? Um, so I'll sort of group it into two groups. The first is the who, what, where, and why. You know, that is the use case. Who might want to use this for what purpose? Um, and then the second is, well, how would they do it? And based on how they do it, when would that happen? Could it happen today? Is it five years from now? Is it 10 years out? Um, and to answer that question, I needed to find people a whole lot smarter than me, right? Uh, so a lot of the work of the, of the, the grant was to put together the right um, expert panel. And if you view the names here, you know, anything they said was not for attribution. Um, but these are some of the smartest people in this field in America today. We maybe missed one or two names that you might have expected to see here. Um, but we have, um, you know, representatives out of government, out of industry, out of academia uh, that really know this field well. And we were able to bring them all together uh, and just talk through the, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and try to frame a more decisive path forward that could possibly frame a fourth waypoint following on to Ed Yu's third waypoint saying, these are the things we need to watch for. Uh, and this is the art of the possible. Um, and and that's, what we, that's what I'll try to get across the next couple of slides without going too deep into the technical. So who, what, where, why, right? Use cases. The biggest couple of takeaways for use cases are to, do, to apply any new technology, but in particular in this space, based on what we know from the medical side of things and, and precision medicine, it is really hard to predict the effect of any sort of genetic manipulation without extensive test and evaluation. So if you consider a genetic weapon, what that would imply is test and evaluation 
on the target prop population. Um, so hypothetically, um, China, if they wanted to test on their own, you know, uh, subpopulation within their country, they might be able to incarcerate them and test them or something. Um, from a more US standpoint, um, it's difficult to envision how any test and evaluation could be performed uh, without there being indicators for us to pick up on from a left of launch surveillance type of um, uh, approach, you know, non-proliferation, counter-proliferation approach. Um, the bottom line is that laboratory results in clinical practice don't translate directly to what, to what they see when they go actually to patients. Um, the effects are unpredictable. The efficiency is incredibly low, which I'll talk about later. Um, and that's why this is a burgeoning field. I mean, it's, it's taken us a lot of years. And, you know, 20 years ago, when I was still finishing medical school, we thought we would cure cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia because those are just, you know, single gene changes, basically. Um, and we still have it, right? So that, because it's not easy. And so apply that thought to, to genetic weapons and you start to think, well, it really isn't easy. And if the goal is to target a local population, uh, you know, a localized population, well, there are a whole lot better options, whether that's a gun, a bomb, or, you know, targeting it as one of our panel members like to use sort of the the American beer scenario, right? You know, if you're an adherent Muslim, you don't drink beer in the first place. Certainly most people don't drink, say, Coors Light overseas, you know, so you have other ways of targeting to find populations um, that are easier, more predictable, less cost, less resource intensive, um, require less skill than a genetic weapon. So logically, why would someone pursue it? And, you know, then you have to get into the whole logical versus illogical argument. And, uh, you know, is, is everyone behaving logically? My, my take on that is, uh, you know, I think of, I would think of Russia as someone that would be exploring this technology, whether it's logical or not. That's based on historical precedent. I think of China as someone that probably wants to know what the capability is the same way we do. Um, but I don't know, and I can't say for sure, how interested they would be in pursuing it. And we'll get into that uh, as we go forward. But so the, the key is when you're thinking about a use case, what's the objective, what's the timeline to achieve it, and what's the easiest way to get there? And I'll have another matrix slide later where I revisit this, but the expert panel and, and really sort of convinced me as we were talking, really, you know, was, was pretty confident that unless countries were just investing significantly in this, this weapons technology or the weapons application of this technology, uh, it just wouldn't um, be something that is worth their interest. Um, and especially without a TNE program, which is something we could pick up. So that's probably one of the first key findings from our report is watch for a TNE program. Okay, so that's the who, what, uh, where, why. So let's talk about the how and when. Um, so this slide will just sort of show summary points and then we'll dissect through it in the next couple. Um, but the first summary point is precision medicine, like we talked about, is all about data. Um, the more data you can collect and the better you can get at collating that data, um, the more likely you are to have success at developing a genetic weapon. Are developing a, a, a precision medicine um, capability, right? And so um, data is being collected actively by every country, US, China, everyone else, genetic data. And it's being applied in the fields of precision medicine and forensic applications. In precision medicine, the main application is something we call pharmacogenetics. So that's basically what we talked about before, trying to understand how the, the ge genetic differences in people affect the metabolism of, uh, of or the, you know, the full ADME pathway of a given pharmaceutical. And that's from two perspectives, from efficacy and from adverse effects. Um, and then of course, the, there's technological advance that's changing sort of everything on a day-to-day -day basis that we're talking about. So that's sort of going findings for what about, what's the, how do we evaluate technical feasibility? Built on those findings, 
we said, okay, to make a weapon that is meets the definition of a genetic weapon, uh, it would have to target a specific population's uh, genome, um, and it would have to not target outside populations' genomes. Um, it would have to affect a desired change when it's targeted. Um, it would have to get into the cells to affect that change, and it would have to get into the body to get into the cells, right? So those were the five key things. We'll sort of lump those together as we go forward, but now we're, that was just the lead in, and then we'll sort of dissect down into this a little bit. So I got hung up on this, this stuff, and I won't, I won't go into it here, but I, I, the report goes into it a bit more, and I just find it interesting. So, you know, there are various theories about where humans came from, and everyone's heard, oh, we're, we've got the 60% of the genetic code of a banana, which is true, 90% uh, of the genetic, genetic code of a cat, which is also true. Um, so there's the, the general concept, and these are all hypotheses, of course, is that all life started at one point. Uh, and then significant, so as life reproduces, there are mistakes, right? And, and those mistakes are occurring in the genetic code. Big mistakes make big changes. Little mistakes make little changes. Eventually a big mistake happened that created the first human. And that first human, according to the out of Africa hypothesis, uh, then spread to create all of us. Uh, which is why we have 99.9% .9 genetic similarity among all humans. So what makes up the difference? Well, the difference is first, as those humans were migrating, geographic barriers and other things were causing them to sort of group together. And, and, and that's why you'll see, you know, Asians will have certain characteristics and Blacks will have certain characteristics. And, you know, and you can sort of just go through the different groupings of characteristics. And that's a lot of it is based on just migratory patterns and how that affects your gene pool and what genes are available to be reconnected back and forth again, generation after generation. Ultimately, everyone's spread out and there are sort of um, what we would call ancestry informative SNPs, which means anc ancestry informative single nucleotide polymorphisms. What does that mean? Well, polymorphism just means poly multiple morph change, right? So something is different, okay? Single nucleotide, one little letter, A, C, T, or G, and the whole thing, that's a single nucleotide, okay? So that's what we're talking about in terms of what makes me, me, and Robert, Robert, and all of you, all of you. It's just these little single changes uh, that make us all different. Um, but some of these single nucleotides are the same for me as uh, my relatives and those who share biogeographic ge ancestry all the way back to the very beginning. And those are what's called ancestry informative SNPs. Then there's another type called phenotype informative SNPs, which I'm not talking about, but that's for things like color uh, or eye color or hair color, skin color, things like that. And those SNPs being preserved are potentially targetable, right? If you wanted to get everyone with black skin, like we started about, at, about at with Project Coast, there is a phenotype informative SNP, which can tell you this is most likely to be conserved in black people. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist in everyone else because of all the interbreeding that goes on, right? Um, but that's what we're talking about in terms of trying to target a population with a sort of genetic weapon and how it's built off of the research that's been done for both forensic applications and precision medicine applications. So where then is the challenge? You know, it seems like, oh, well, we, now we can figure that out. Uh, you know, there's, you know, we look at Rich, he's got this and he's white. And we'll just use all the same things and then we'll get all the white people. Well, it doesn't really work like that because what you're trying to do with a gen genetic weapon is you're trying to hit a precise population. And there's an inverse relationship between whether something is highly frequent, which means it's in all of the group, or highly specific, which means it's only in that group and not in any other group. Um, so an example would be, um, you know, if we're talking about populations, first of all, you could spend hours, and I, I can tell you our group did, trying to define what a population is. But if you define populations, for example, by language, there's 7,000 different languages, okay? That can basically tell you 
there are 7,000 generally endogamous populations, meaning populations that intermarry and breed among themselves. We've only characterized 144 of them, according to one leading researcher, or one leading researcher has only characterized 144 of them. So we're infantile in the space of understanding the full range of different gen genomic subsets for these populations. But looking at those initial subsets, we can see, hey, here's one language, one subpopulation, and it happens to be the, the, one of the Chinese subpopulations. And maybe it's different from the Han Chinese, but it's really close to the Mongolians. And why? Because there's interbreeding, right? And so to find something that's frequent enough to get your target population from a weapons perspective, but specific enough to not get everyone else is very, very challenging. So what's one way you can uh, try to worry, like let's say your goal is to preserve, make sure you preserve your own population. That's the main goal. Then you would do something called, called multiplexing, right? Where you could identify seven different SNPs, which will then decrease the frequency of your target population because now instead of just looking for rich has brown hair, you're looking for, we want a guy with you know brown hair, brown eyes and big ears or whatever. And now you got me, right? But you got a lot less of the other people that were before like me. Uh, so you have a more specific target, but now you're getting a lot less of us, right? So if you're thinking about efficiency as a weapon, it's, a it's, it's very difficult to get your tar target population is what, what I'm sort of getting at. Um, so we'll revisit this in a minute, but that's, that's what we're talking about in terms of actually understanding what the unique conserved sequence is that might be targeted from the perspective of a weapon. Okay, so now let's talk about how you target it. So this is the flip the whole presentation on a tier slide. <laughs> so we started with trying to understand back from 2002, okay, there are functional or regulatory genetic elements. And those are the ones that we, um, we really need to be concerned about um, because those are the ones where if you flip an on on off switch, just to make it easy to understand for me, because uh, I, I need it simple. So flip an on off switch, those are the ones that can cause damage, right? Um, so for example, there are things called proto-oncogenes. We all have them and they're off. And if they flip on, we get cancer, right? So if you can figure out a proto-oncogene that is only in a certain subset of the population and figure out how to access it and flip it on, then you potentially could have a genetic weapon, right? So that was the going in first six months, probably the research. Uh, but as the research dug in technically, it started to become apparent that the threat was a little bit different than we understood. And a lot of that is because of CRISPR. And so because of CRISPR, there are just things you can do um, that don't require you to, to, to need to know a functional sequence. Um, and in fact, they may not require you to even know a unique sequence. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But so from a functional sequence perspective, um, I've included one of the articles here that tries to illustrate the point. But the point is this, you can, if you know a sequence that is in your target population uniquely, uh, CRISPR, what CRISPR does is it, it's a, a match of that target sequence. And when it finds that target sequence, it has scissors and it cuts. Well, that alone, that activity alone, just finding a target sequence and cutting it, whether or not that target sequence is a functional gene or not, doesn't matter. If you cut a whole bunch of these little things for, little, for different target sequences in a population, you don't necessarily know what the effect is going to be because you don't have the T and E, but you can assume that you're, you're screwing up body function in various different ways. And if you do that in multiple different locations, you could conceivably have you know, an impact up to total fail right, of the whole body. Um, and so that's sort of, okay, that's now a, a very sort of easy thing to do from a targeting perspective. Doesn't mean it's easy to make a weapon, that's the next slide, but from a targeting perspective. The other thing, which is much more te technically complex, but also sort of equally alarming is you can have that matching sequence when it finds a match. So here's my DNA, it's looking, it's looking, it matches. That match will then release 
an activity. Okay. And so some of you, you know, if you remember back to high school biology, the easy thing to remember is like when you do the experiments and you get something that turned green, right? It's that, that type of example, except from a, a, a CRISPR Cas precision medicine concept. So in this case, you're actually causing what we call collateral cleavage, where something else that's inactive becomes active. And imagine that something being in inactive being something that kills you, and then you make it active, right? There are weapons potential items there that maybe we hadn't foreseen um, when we were, you know, in the first six months of research until we started delving more into this, uh, this technology. So what that uh, sort of leads into is now we've talked about uh, sequences and, and finding unique sequences. And then we've talked about how to actually affect the desired change on those sequences. Well, now we're getting to the real technical challenge, it turns out. And the real technical challenge is actually accessing those sequences and exerting an effect. And that's, there's sort of two stages to that. There's in your body getting into the cell and there's from the outside getting to your body. Uh, so let's talk about the first first. So example of real life. If we wanted to do a very minor genetic edit to, um, to correct sickle cell deficiency, what we would have to do right now is draw blood from a patient, uh, use ablative chemotherapy, then make the genetic edit ex vivo in the lab, then grow the cells up, and then put them back in the body. And our yield for that is somewhere in the range of 30 to 40%. So that is an incredible amount of money, an incredible amount of time, and a very inefficient process. And that's blood cells. That's not tissue cells or anything else more complex. That's blood that you can just draw out, right? Um, so 20 years of research talking about curing sickle cell or curing cystic fibrosis, that, that's why it's so challenging. We can't get the efficient cellular delivery despite tons of investment in the area. And this is an area where we, as a scientist, scientific community will continue to invest because this is the holy grail for us as far as precision medicine. And it just happens that that holy grail for us also is one of the big uh, boundaries to a, a potential weapons capability. Uh, so that's the timeline to get into a cell. That's the, the, the challenge and where the money is being spent right now from a, a you know, legitimate, need to have a perspective to save lives. Um, then going from external to the body so that it can get into the cell. So that's an area where there really isn't a lot of research going on and there really isn't a use case for a lot of research. So that's another area, just like the test and evaluation area we identified earlier, that is something that should be watched and it should be something where it raises a red flag. Now there's a lot of discussion in our group about that area, because I'm sure you guys are following, and especially in the SARS-CoV-2 days, you know, we've talked about mass vaccination by aerosol. You know, there are papers about it. There are technologies out there. So I'm not saying the technology doesn't exist. I'm saying the resource investment incentive isn't there. The resource investment incentive is to get things into cells. It's not to get things from five kilometers away into my body. Okay, so where we're going with all that is to understand the target DNA, which is reading, a lot of people can do it right now. Se sequencing technology has been around. Uh, to be able to write a piece of DNA that matches to it, people are getting better at it, harder. Deliver, super hard. Delivery at scale, generally not even done. After all of that, you still don't have a predictable effect, right? So. In the big picture, this is starting to sound like a very unappealing weapon. So this is a slide I added and I sort of added it against my better judgment because I felt like a wrap up was missing from my earlier blabbing, right? Um, and we need to be careful a little bit. We don't want, you know, obviously we're not trying to teach people how to make weapons here and there are security considerations with everything we're talking about. But if we just go back to those original use cases, and the idea that precision medicine is focused on collecting data and using those data to understand functional and regulatory genetic elements that impact medications, right? 
then it turns out that's not really where we need to really be focused on our efforts right now. That's where we need to focus from the EDU problem, which is the bioeconomy. Uh, but from a weapons problem, a lot more of the focus is on that delivery step. And it's delivery step at the cellular barrier, which is legitimate and with investment and will be broken. Uh, and then there's delivery at scale, which is less legitimate and with the right um, you know, norms and threat reduction approaches could potentially be prohibited. Um, so if you line it up to use cases, um, if you really want to get a target population like we started out with, a genetic weapon trying to get a target population based on their genomic profile, well, that's the hardest thing. You need a sequence that's unique. You need to be able to get into delivery, deliver it at, um, you know, into the cells, and you need to be able to deliver it to that population at a distance. Um, but if you want to just get one person, you don't necessarily need them to have a relative who went to 23andMe and, and got a, a genomic test done and you need, don't necessarily need to take those, you know, DNA data and figure out a, a potential target for that individual. You can almost just use a target that you know is in everyone. And if you are just getting that person with some sort of injection mechanism, uh, so you don't need delivery at scale, then what your real technical hurdle is to that is the same technical hurdle as precision medicine, getting things into the cell. Um, and then, you know, for a, just a perspective, well, let's say you're, you're just someone that wants, you know, wants an existential, wants to create an existential threat, right? Um, which is something we always have to think about. You know, then you're not really worried about the unique sequence, right? You can use a sequence that we know is in everybody. And uh, you can, uh, if you get over the delivery into cells um, challenge, you can, for any little person you touch with a needle, you can potentially have that impact. But still to deliver at scale, um, that's something that we should be able to prevent. So that's sort of how I frame the three use cases. And that's why you'll see in the report, both from a who, what, where, why, and a how, when perspective, it's really the specific individual use case um, where we think the, 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 the greatest likelihood of potential application applies. Um, and that fits other things we know about adversarial behavior and calling cards and things like that. And I don't think I need to say anything more about that if you guys know where I'm going. Um, so let's just sort of do a summary and I apologize, I've probably been blabbing on forever, Robert. Um, but uh, just for a summary on, on where we are. So use cases, there are other options. So it doesn't mean we should think people are not gonna be pursuing these technologies, but it means that we should try to understand who might and with what objective. Um, second, how and when, technical feasibility. With CRISPR, you know, it's widely used, but the t &E and delivery of scale are limiting factors. So the technology we need to watch is getting things into cells, but we have to understand that that challenge will be broken and it will either be broken either on a five-year timeline or a 10-year timeline or a 20-year timeline, but is where all the money is right. Uh, so the other two are things where we need to cut them off early and watch for them. And how do you do that? Um, well, first, you have to make sure peaceful applications are protected. And that's what I was saying at the very beginning. I, I don't want to lose that message. That's the most important message. Then you have to pursue international norms. Those of you who know me know that, you know, anyone who's been around for a while can get kind of, you know, it's, just, it's hard to believe in those, right? So what if those don't work, right? It'd be great to say they will, but what if they don't work? Well, then what else do we got? You know, we've got uh, national level export controls and, and that's sort of on two fronts. That's on the genomic data. But again, from my perspective, that would be focused more on our, our bioeconomy. Uh, and then there's the biotechnology, uh, which we, you know, we already have um, standards in place for, uh, and we need to, to uh, be sure we, we continue to keep those up to date with the technology. Right, uh, and then we really need to monitor for T and E uh, and for delivery of scale and things like that. And then the last bullet is one that we go into quite a bit of detail in the report, maybe a couple of pages at least. Um, but all of this advance uh, is for good, and all of this advance has negative applications. That's the de definition of dual use. 
but all this advance also has counter applications to those negative applications. Um, so, you know, you can read some interesting uh, details on DARPA programs that are designed to undo these changes. Um, and the whole goal, and it's, it's Andy, you know, Andy Weber, all you guys know who he is. It's, it's, his, it's his concept and I love it. You know, the concept, well, you know, it's been around forever, but he's, he's really championing it in this field is the concept of deterrence by denial. If you can constantly outpace the threat with your defense, then you're basically preempting anyone's um, incentive to pursue the weapon, right? And so in the case of uh, genetic weapons, right now, DARPA and other bodies are trying to outpace the threat uh, in order to disincentivize it being pursued. I don't think that means Russia won't pursue it, uh, but I do think that it's the right move. Uh, and at worst case, it means we're prepared to respond. So I do apologize for going on long. Um, it's nice to see you all. I'll hand it over to, to Robert maybe to, to shed some light on the export controls since I very uh, subtly glossed over that point. Um, and knowing that he's the expert and I'm, I'm not smart at all on that one. So uh, thanks very much and I'll hand it over to Robert. Great, um, uh, Rich, thank you uh, so much again for this um, just you know, excellent uh, sort of walkthrough of um, you know of you know the, uh, the te technology itself and precision medicine, but also really sort of exploring it through the lens of its you know potential uh, sort of military uh, applications and specific to um, you know genetic weapon systems. I think you know this was just so illuminating uh, for for all of us, and um, you know very key because when we are. Uh, discussing um, sort of any emerging uh, technology, you know, first and foremost in that discussion is is understanding, you know, the the full uh, scope of what is meant by dual use, and I, I think, um, uh, you know, this includes, uh, you know, Rich, as you mentioned, you know, the um, peaceful applications, the the tremendous upside in terms of, you know, benefit for human welfare and so forth, particularly, you know, when we're speaking of, of biotechnologies and bio, biomedicine and the importance of preserving those, while at the same time understanding, you know, to what extent, you know, can these technologies with, with such a great upside, can they apply, be, be applied to a sort of a, a, let's say a military scenario and a military use. Um, and the among the policy recommendations, I'll take the chair's prerogative here very briefly to just comment on um, the, the export control policy recommendation, but just with the emphasis that that's just one of the set of policy recommendations uh, that, that Rich walked through in his concluding slide. And it's not to place any undue weight on export controls versus the others, rather, it's important to view all of those in concert, but um, perhaps a reflection of the technology itself and this, this uh, you know, some of the sort of the, the uh, uh, difficulties both with the sort of civilian application and the military application. There's, there are difficulties in applying export controls uh, to this specific, to these, this specific technology and in, in case. And um, notably, um, Data itself is not traditionally um, something that is the, the focus of export controls. Rather, it's the know-how, the, the, the technology, what is actually needed to produce a sensitive technology. So when we're speaking of human genomic information and data, you know, the, the, the toolkit presently is, 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 is not well geared uh, for that. And in fact, there's an emphasis, and I think rightfully so, for peaceful applications for the human welfare benefit to share data in support of scientific research and, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, so the focus really has been more on information that's actually know how. How do you build something? How do you make a technology and so forth? And that's certainly relevant here. But with respect to data, it's, it's very much a challenge, especially when that data is already now being widely shared and distributed. Um, that said, there's been um, just in the past 12 to 24 months, uh, significant developments and upgrades to the quote unquote export control toolkit, particularly in the US uh, with 
um, a fully updated export control law in 2018 that was paired with a law um, uh, governing uh, foreign direct investment in managing the security implications of, say, acquisition of US companies uh, from um, foreign-based purchasers. These tools have, are now somewhat linked, have been upgraded. And so uh, what we are recommending is really that policymakers be aware of the details of these uh, toolkits, what some of the new provisions are. And also we are seeing you know, an expanded and arguably creative use of end user specific controls uh, that um, have increasingly been rolled out within the US system. And so this could be a, a means by which the management of data could be supported uh, by if let's say there are end users that are working in the testing and evaluation arena or delivery at scale, we see that there's an actor sort of, if there's indications that an actor is involved in those areas, then end user based controls start to make sense and that toolkit has expanded. So just a couple of thoughts there, again, not to place undue weight on one of the six policy recommendations that were highlighted in that slide. 